And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Sean Anderson from the CSUCI Environmental Science Department. Woo! Woo! Wow. Woo! Dr. Anderson will discuss biodiversity issues in our local Conejo Valley and possible futures for our area. And I have more to say, but I That's think that you'd rather hear from him. So thank you. Oh, thank you, dear. Thank you, dear. Yeah. Um, Thanks you guys for having me. Uh, wonderful. Love your guys' group. Love your energy. It's, it's awesome. Um, we had a little bit of a technical uh, hiccup here, so I had a couple videos that we can't play those videos right now, but it's okay. Like 99% of it's going to work fine. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk to you guys today, um, just some general stuff about uh, climate change issues and everything, but also the power that you all have, um, which, is, which is considerable in terms of dealing with this crazy world that we're in. So, um, oh, there you go, right, thank you, perfect. So, um, yeah, so first I want to mention lifeboat ethics, right, which normally we think of as this very uh, scary thing and horrible stuff and, you know, shoving someone off and dying and everything. Another, a different way to think about lifeboat ethics, your gardens as a lifeboat. So it's a positive thing, bringing folks into the lifeboat as opposed to shoving them out of the lifeboat. And this is a video that, that, that won't play. This was about an hour ago in my house, but, but this is this, um, a grapevine I'm putting in in the front, and if the video played, you would see, um, you would see a little uh, gopher snake uh, crawl right over there on the left. is crawling in my hole, and he wants to be where the, uh, where the grapes are, right? So, yeah. so obviously when we, when we take all the fantastic tools that you guys are taking, not having the pesticides, not having the intense fertilizers and all that kind of good stuff. Um, you get all kinds of wildlife, all kinds of things can come onto your lifeboat. Um, I think we also uh, uh, tend to um, think of uh, some of the, the challenges that we face, that we need these big, huge institutions. It's wonderful that we have these big institutions. In this case, this is the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy and um, uh, a fantastic organization that has been going since about 1979 here in our area, acquiring open space, doing all this great stuff. In this case, this was a couple weeks ago, we were dedicating um, a chunk of land very close to the, one of the edges of the um, new um, Liberty Canyon Wildlife Crossing yeah. and, and, and accumulating a, a bunch of different parcels and uh, dedicating them to a former supervisor, former representative, Sheila Kuehl. And which is great, but sometimes we think of like, oh man, there's like some crazy people over there in, in Sacramento or whatever doing great stuff, but that's not me. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, wonderful stuff, but we sometimes wonder, you know, what, what do we have? Um, what's up for us? This is a image of um, search terms and, and how, how our society thinks of things. So in this case, we have um, uh, this, is, this is time over there on the left, back in the day till, uh, to, to um, a couple years ago. And this is the popularity of these terms. So, so this, is a, this is one measure of how much attention we're giving these things. Down here on the bottom of the axis, you can't really read it, doesn't matter. Habitat fragmentation, endangered species, all that stuff is barely registers a dot. The two big things are uh, mass extinction, all that stuff's gone. The two big things are climate pollution, really big in the 60s, right? Santa Barbara oil spill, all that kind of stuff. But we're less interested in pollution these days, but it's still relatively popular, climate change. So climate change is, is the, the cause du jour, the, the biggie today, right? And while climate change is absolutely a problem, we'll talk about that in a second, um, our biodiversity crisis is at least as problematic, if not much more significantly problematic, but it doesn't get the, the press that climate change does. Both are serious, both are real challenges. Um, and so to make sure we're contextual, and again, I'll, I'll talk forever because I'm a professor. So if I'm going too long, you guys just and I'll, I, can, I can pivot and shut down very quickly. Um, um, okay, so, so uh, uh, this is my, I have an Uncle Toad. Uh, you might have an Uncle Al or whoever it is in your, in your family. Uncle Toad was a crazy dude that uh, sometimes it, it Parties was an interesting guy to have around, but we wouldn't always, wouldn't always talk about Uncle Toad because he was kind of a, you know, the one nobody really wanted to talk about, kind of freaked people out and that kind of stuff. 
Um, and that's what a lot of, a lot of our challenges in our, in our world right now are like. So um, right now only 23% of the terrestrial land outside of Antarctica and Greenland, only 23% of our terrestrial land is considered still a wilderness, right? So the vast majority of the land we've tamed with agriculture, with freeways, with all that kind of stuff. Um, it's very likely that we'll have about a million species um, that go extinct between now and 2100 on planet Earth. That's, that's a, a massive um, extinction uh, level event of the scale of an asteroid striking the Earth. But in this case, it's us doing that. Uh, closer to home here in California, uh, uh, we uh, have about 20% fewer, about one-fifth fewer, the abundance of critters just going around that we had about 100, 150 years ago. We have 600 species of plants and animals that are threatened or endangered. So, so while California is doing better than some places, we still are an epicenter of challenges here because we, were, we started so diverse. Um, uh, and then I, I go, 90% of our wet, we, we only have 90% or 90% of our wetlands um, uh, are gone from now compared to 150 years ago. About 99% of our historic riparian habitat and the majority of our native grasslands gone, right, from, from um, here. Uh, and I can go through and, and list more negative statistics, but it, it's scary. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about in the context of what we're caring about, gardening and all that good stuff and, and growing things. Um, as you all have experienced, things are getting crazy, right? We historically have used the past as the predictor for what's going on. Oh, it's going to get warm around this month. It'll start to drizzle in October, so we've got to start putting down uh, you know, erosion barriers around construction sites on October 15th is the rule of thumb in the state of California. But, but, but things are getting crazier and crazier. Yeah. So um, here is an example. So, so the first thing to say before we get into that, we've always been a very noisy system, particularly here in Southern California. We're a Mediterranean ecosystem. There is no such thing as a normal year, even though weather people quote it and everybody says normal, normal, normal. There's never been a normal year. Um, even before climate change came along. So this is, um, this is our uh, uh, rainfall patterns. And you know, we have these nice smooth lines in the middle that go from back in the day to now to sort of say this is kind of a drier period or a wetter period. But really, look at those dots, right? Really, it's not like, oh, kind of warmer. kind of. It's like, oh my god, lots of rain. Oh my god, not a lot of rain. Oh my god, lots of rain. Oh my god, not a lot of rain, right? So, so we started with a noisy system to begin with here. And what we're doing is we're making it even noisier. Um, so, uh, so this is, uh, this is um, during uh, the Dust Bowl. This is not California, but this was what drove many, many people to California and became the subject of Steinbeck novels and all that kind of stuff, right? This was an active choice that we made to plow under the grasslands in the middle part of our country and um, screw with the vegetation that was holding down those soils and allowed for this massive erosional feedback to get going and, uh, and, and you know, devastated um, uh, farming and, and communities and everything. So we've been here before. This is, pro we always talk about the deep water horizon. I worked on the deep water horizon and all these different issues. Santa Barbara oil spill, huge challenges to be sure. But the Dust Bowl is to date the greatest environmental disaster our country has uh, been through. And again, another one completely of our own creation. Um, so so we, we've been here before. And I would say that uh, Ventura County, not just because we're here, but we have a lot of objective data to say that Ventura County really is at ground zero for climate change, particularly for our state and region. Um, it doesn't seem like it, but because of the uh, happenstance of geography and, and, and other factors, um, we really are experiencing some of the craziest uh, dimensions of climate change right here. So we can talk about a couple different things. We can talk about temperature. You guys, you guys were worrying about when we're getting buds set and all that kind of good stuff. It's basically getting hotter and hotter here in California. You guys know this. We, we, well, it doesn't seem like it right now. <laughs> this, this month is a little bit weird, but that actually proves the point, right? We're getting Hotter and hotter, hotter, and colder and colder, but we're getting noisier and noisier is the clearest pattern from all this stuff. Um, and so this is, this is the deviation, long-term deviation um, of temperatures. And what you see is some areas, particularly 
us over here in Ventura County, we are aberrantly different. So, so some places are up, some of us down, but as far as the proportional change, we, are, we have changed more than almost anywhere else in the country. Um, it's, it's, we're, we're aberrantly different than even just a few uh, 50, 60 miles away from, from our county here. Um, and uh, if I had this, if this was animated, you'd see a couple things going on here, but suffice it to say, um, we are getting warmer and we're continuing to get warmer. So this over here is the temperature change um, localized. And check it out, Southern Santa Barbara, Ventura County, we are the epicenter in the state, right? There's, if you go way up to the <coughs> upper right-hand corner of the state, also uh, quite extre extreme change, but um, not much is as crazy as we are, especially for a coastal county where we have the ameliorating effects of the ocean. Um, uh, pretty crazy. Um, and this is what we're doing here in Thousand Oaks. So Thousand Oaks, you guys can't quite read the bottom there, but on the left-hand side, it's cut off and, and Safari's having a party on the bottom of my screen. Um, so that's 2000 on the left-hand side. And the one on the right over here, this other dot, is 2050. So this is the temperature change of right here where you're sitting um, uh, by, by the time we get to you know, another uh, uh, 20 years or so. Um, uh, you know, three and a half degrees, four degrees might not seem like a lot to some folks, but you guys as gardeners know that an average change of four degrees mm -hmm is a lot, right? That's a huge amount. That's the difference between stuff coming out weeks early, mismatch between caterpillars and, and, and leaf set and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and uh, there's all kinds of other things that are happening. We can skip those. Those are just some examples. Um, but essentially what's happening is we're shifting our weather right here. So this is, these are the uh, typical um, uh, temperature ranges. The gray bar, or the, what on your screen looks like uh, the dark bars on the left, that's the average from 1986 to 2015 per month, uh, temperature ranges per month. And then the uh, green is the predicted average from for the period from 2036 to 2065. So, um, you know, we still, have the, the, we still have obviously seasons. We pretend we don't have seasons here, but we have a little bit of seasons mm -hmm. here. Um, but, but everything's getting shifted, right? So, so, so um, the hots are getting hotter. The same with rainfall. Uh, so, let me kill this guy right here. So, um, so right, so, so um, we now have an aberrantly high snowpack, the highest snowpack we've, we've recorded since we became a state, right? But before then, this is the era that we're in. And in fact, this is still the, the long-term era that we're in. So on the left is the average snowpack on the Sierras, all that white is snow. Um, and the, the right image over there is uh, in uh, the water year 2015, which was the first big whack before we had this last big round of drought. And when you would fly over the Sierra, when I flew over the Sierras in 2015, it looked like there was no snow you know, throughout the entire, uh, entirety of that area which is a large chunk of the water that we utilize here in Ventura County. So we're changing our snowpack. And again, if we look at the overall, overall water risk, um, have a look again, California, and in particular, our little chunk is also aberrantly uh, uh, different, right? So we're seeing this with temperature, we're seeing this with, with water stress in the soils, all this kind of stuff. And when we look at um, uh, how high a risk we are at water stress, California is an outlier, right? We are, we are one of the most stressed, in terms of, uh, of water supply to our ecosystems, we are one of the most stressed areas in our continent. Um, and then again, we here in Ventura County are a bit more than that. And, and, we can, and, and again, what we're seeing is, so this, this, is, this, is, a met this is a metric looking at average temperature on the, on the bottom axis, average rainfall on the, the upper part. And what you see is the last several years are all on the right-hand side of this graph, right? The last few years, we're getting warmer and warmer. And increasingly, when we have these problem years for, um, for seed set, for all these things, it's in this lower right quadrant, which is this um, you know, really, really hot, not a lot of water available. And we'll skip that. Um, but again, Noise. So this is right now. This is the most recent report as of this week. So on the left was our drought conditions a year ago today. And you see, and what you, you don't need to read the legend. Just know that the hotter the color, the darker red, the more droughty, right? And the more white, the, the less color, 
um, the better, the, the less drought stress there is. And so we went from the worst condition we've seen, not just the worst condition, but the transition from where we were to the worst condition faster than we've ever seen before. Actually faster than some models predicted we could get uh, that dry that fast. And, and then we got the amazing series of atmospheric rivers this year, and, and we're, we're back to quote unquote normal, right? Again, the long-term pattern is drought stress, drought stress. But for you as gardeners, as you guys all know, um, we're getting the, these extreme sw swings of, oh my God, there's too much water in my garden this year, and oh my God, there's not enough uh, next year, and then American water won't let me water, and then things are getting stressed, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, so a couple more things here, and then we'll talk about some happy talk. Um, but uh, uh, a lot of the discourse around this, again, is incorrect, or it's not incorrect, but it's, um, it's misleading. It's misleading. So we have this crazy thing in our country where we talk about the 100-year drought event, or the 100-year storm event. Totally insane, doesn't make any sense. It sounds, it's designed to make you feel confident. Hey, very rare chance, right? One in a, a, a once in a century event, well, that's only once in a century. That's not how you should be interpreting it. <laughs> so what that actually means is a 1% chance of that happening each year over the course of a century. Which again, first pass, that sounds pretty good, right? 1% chance, that's pretty good. Um, but what that really means is most of us aren't independently wealthy. And we don't have a big trust fund that we buy our houses and our cars and whatever. So we mostly mortgage our houses, right? And some of us can get, you know, 14-year, 15-year mortgages. Most of us get a 30-year mortgage. And so for most houses, what that says is a 100-year a one, a, a 100 flood event means that you have a 26% chance of your house flooding before you pay off your mortgage, right? That's a very different way to think about this. Um, and... Uh, most, of the, uh, most of the places elsewhere in the world that, that think more rationally about risk and things of that nature would never in a million years suggest using a, a one in, you know, a one percent chance a year. They want it much more lower. So to give you a sense, the Netherlands uses a probability of anywhere from one in a thousand two hundred fifty year chance to one in a ten thousand year chance. So orders of magnitude more conservative than are we. Um, and so they are, they, because the Netherlands has flooded and had catastrophic problems throughout their, their um, history, but especially in the wake of World War II. And so they know what it's like to have these massive disasters lay waste, waste to their society. So they're serious about how they plan for risk and all that kind of good stuff. There's lots of reasons for that we can talk about if you care about. But um, I'll just finish up this stuff by talking about, and another key thing is the, are our winds. Another reason why we are so different from a lot of the rest of the country is, is our Santa Ana's that, that uh, uh, blow through our area. And um, these are just, this is one example from one year, but just uh, examples of fires. Um, and the black dots are fires that were fueled from Santa Ana's. The white dots are things that were fueled through other things. And most of the damaging fires are Santa Ana wind driven events. So we had a project looking in the wake of the, of the Thomas fire at oil seeps that were on fire. And generally speaking, it's hard to get an oil seep caught on fire because the oil comes up in naturally occurring seeps. This isn't an oil spill, it's a naturally occurring uh, uh, phenomenon in our, of our part of the world. Um, and the, but that tar, that's, that, that, that sludge is toxic, right? So it kills most of the plants. You don't have a lot of plants growing around an oil seep. So when you have a regular fire, a non-wind-fueled fire, the fire kind of burns up to some of the grasses around the edge and they kind of go out. But as we're having more and more of these Santa Ana winds and more and more of these intense Santa Ana winds meshed with, with fire events, we're seeing this type of event, which is from the Thomas fire, which is instead of the flames going up or the flames going up at like a 45 degree angle, the flames are almost horizontal and we're seeing like 100 foot flame lengths. So even though, so these areas that were protected and would not ignite are now essentially being blowtorched and they're, they're catching on fire more often. Not only they are, but that means our homes and our gardens and other things are at risk, even if we have these buffers around uh, our properties or our, our, um, our fruit trees or whatever it is. And so you can't see this, this is an animation, this is not showing up uh, on this one, but essentially if, if it was, if it was, if you could see it on my, on my desktop, I can show you after if you like. This goes from 1986 to 2050, 
and we show the change. So basically, the, the, the temperature, the climate in St. Louis is ne will now be about here. Nashville, about here. Uh, Florence, about here. So we're changing the very nature of the types of, of plants that can grow um, uh, in our habitat. And so, uh, okay, so that's all the scary stuff. Oh my God, that's uh, horrible. But, but the good news is that you have, you all, especially in this room, you all have a lot of agency. You have a lot of ways to engage and, and, and make change. The first thing is that you influence our overall glide path. And just like Ventura County is the epicenter for a lot of um, the scariness of, our, of the coming years, um, we, all, we are also a beacon of hope. And I'm not, again, not saying that because from here with you guys here, this is, I get calls all the time from places around the country. How did you guys do this? How did you guys do that? And we don't hear that enough here in Ventura County. We just hear problem, problem, problem. <laughs> we have these weird, crazy, racist people over here, or this or that, or whatever, and oh my God, I don't know. But the reality is, the reality is, we have a lot of power. And we've chosen to, to do things differently because um, we've had some fantastic leadership at our, at our um, uh, different levels of government here in the county and people that have really fought for more sustainable practices, a better uh, place to live for you and everyone here. And so as you see this mountain lion walking on a backyard, some people think that's scary. I think that's awesome. These mountain lions move around all most of our houses, uh, those of us in the wildlands urban interface, and virtually never encounter. People don't understand they're there, they don't know they're there, they're going about their business not hurting anyone. Maybe keeping, maybe keeping the rat population down by the, uh, by the yeah. apple trees. But, uh, yeah. but um, so a couple different examples. Here's an example, our county wildlife corridors. This is, this is an overlay that we started working on about 15 years ago, 16 years ago. Um, and we are the first county in the US to have a wildlife uh, overlay. So what this is, this is for our non-incorporated um, areas of the county. Uh, we have these passages uh, uh, symbolized by the, the lime green color here on the screen that you're looking at. And those are areas where we're more likely to see critters move through the landscape, go from one chunk of the mountain to another chunk of the mountain, go through the uh, um, river court bottom, what, whatever the case may be. And so if you happen to have a, a ranch or a house in this area, you can still do stuff, but you need to have your lights pointed down and a few other things like that to, to not disturb these guys. This was challenged extensively, and, that, and the star right here is, um, uh, uh, this is, was uh, about a year and a half ago, I'm getting old, two years ago, I guess now, almost, um, uh, <laughs> held up under intense legal challenge. It's held up. So not only do we have these robust tools, they've been shown to be effective and indeed stand the test of whatever um, the, the forces aligned against them have thrown against them. So we have these wildlife corridors. So we still have, um, this is a picture from last week. This is a deer on Borchard that got, that got hit. Um, so we still have uh, uh, roadkill and things are still a, a, a true problem, but things are much better given that we have this wildlife corridor overlay. We also have SOAR. Right, which again was, was, was controversial uh, way back when, we've re-upped we've re it. Um, but this is something that sets us aside, right? That, that, that conserves our farmland and prevents the very last harvest of homes and, and all that kind of stuff. To be sure, we need to be building more houses here for, for our neighbors and all that kind of good stuff. But there's ways to do it and there's ways to do it. <clears throat> and, and had we not had SOAR, the Camarillo, Footprint, all that area would look very, more Park, all that area would look very different than what it is now. Um, we also have the power to, as we go forward with these things, uh, choose where we want to have our gardens, our homes, our plants, all this and that. And so this is the, the Borchard, these are the Borchard wetlands, right at the intersection of Borchard and, and 101. Um, and, uh, uh, this is our general plan, which is not done, right? It's open for uh, comment. You all can comment on this. Um, essentially, this plan, by the first time we've updated it in, in decades, um, asked all of you folks and your neighbors, what should we do? And the um, clear vote, at least so far, we'll see what the final plan is, but so far was to densify, right? So when we're having our, our shopping malls not be as, as utilized, whatever, maybe we can put some apartments in there and housing and that kind of stuff and, and concentrate the development there as opposed to in our open space 
in our more transitional, more vulnerable to wildfires and all those uh, areas. So, so these are all good things. This is all you influencing the overall glide path of where we are going here in our, in our, um, in our home. And then lastly, you all control the airplane. Your home is your airplane, and you are the one that owns that stick, right? And you guys are a fantastic example of folks that um, have decided, I want to I wanna do a different kind. I want to I wanna have some cool fruit trees, and I want to have this and that. So um, this is some data from one of my students that was just looking at the efficacy of the, um, our recent uh, drought constraints, or our watering constraints. And um, again, it's cut off a little on the bottom here, but basically, I'll just read it off on the bottom. So these, these are different. Um, uh, uh, people's, what people are doing with their front uh, of their houses right. um, in Simi, Moore Park, and Thousand Oaks in, in, in some paired neighborhoods. And so I'll just read off, start reading off the bottom. So that's, that's people that have a regular grass lawn in the front, <coughs> fake grass lawn, artificial turf, uh, native uh, uh, um, plantings, um, non-native but, but drought, uh, drought tolerant stuff, and then um, uh, or, or, or just you know, concrete, hardscape, nothing, nothing, no, no plants in, in the front of their house. The gray bar um, is uh, low-income areas. The yellow bar are relatively wealthy areas. Some of which were gated communities. Others were just relatively higher income areas. And what you see is um, uh, income. So folks that have are lower on the economic spectrum don't have as much uh, lawn, right? And this was before, this, this happened before the drought, but the drought intensified this. And, uh, and, and um, we've seen the amount of lawn go down in lower income areas, uh, but not in higher income areas. So our, our folks that have more access to more resources aren't, aren't as interested in pulling up lawn and in reducing their, their water use um, out back. Fantastic example of how we can engage with folks and, and, and um, bring them to maybe hopefully a, a different perspective and maybe grow in more of their own food and all that kind of good stuff that you guys are interested in. The world is patchy, right? So we see all this purple sage, all this mimulus, all this sticky monkey flower up here in the hills. Uh, our, our homes are less so. So artificial turf, um, uh, uh, some lawn, but just very simplistic structure. This is a little dark. You can't see this one lower right. This is um, Manhattan Beach this weekend, where right on the beach, but we needed some lawn on the beach because we just need to have some lawn on the beach, right? So, so, um, so our default is simplicity, right? Our, 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 you know, go to Home Depot and get the two or three tulips that you can pick, right? Um, you all are about food and organic gardening, all that wonderful stuff, and you all are about adding other things in. And one of the best uh, approaches you guys can do is one, a diversity, two, heterogeneity. So as we mentioned, as this world is getting windier and sometimes wetter and sometimes whatever, one of the best hedges you can make is variation. That variation in their, both your planting palette and um, just the, even the, 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 the topographic layout of your property. And that will really buy you a lot of insurance um, for stuff. So here in this house, um, um, we have a lot of heterogeneity, right, compared to the, those lawns that we saw. There's, there's topographic heterogeneity for, for birds and, and uh, ground squirrels and all kinds of stuff and, uh, and plant palette uh, diversity. Um, you guys probably know this, but um, uh, we've made fantastic strides in trying to deal with um, some of our problematic types of plants that are sold here in the county. In fact, our county ag uh, folks have sent over 500 letters uh, to different plant sellers asking them to not sell the tropical milkweed, right, the very pretty yeah. showy one, right. and instead to, um, to sell our native milkweed uh, and or other stuff. So we have a lot of folks that are working on growing some of the other native species. There's multiple species of native, but, but regardless, the long leaf, our, long leaf, our, our default one, um, and just about everybody is like, sure, that sounds great. We'll stop, we'll stop selling that. Um, not everybody has. Uh, I, I won't, um, I won't uh, name names, Lowe's, uh, that this, where this is. Um, but in this case, unfortunately, these folks are still selling the tropical milkweed. And as you guys, you probably know this, but just to, to, to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, beautiful plant, wonderful plant, tall showy plant, does not die back as does ours, right? It's, doesn't have that annual dieback, and so therefore, 
it essentially picks up uh, cringies. We'll call them cringies. And these cringies, um, when the monarchs alight on these individuals, either the, the adult or the larva, um, and they get infected by the cringies, and that is bad. That kills them, right? So, so it's not as if the plant is inherently evil per se, but the, the plant um, allows some cringies to hang on. And so, so the answer is to get rid of these guys. And as you guys, uh, you guys are um, uh, possibly going to go do an event with Antonio, and, and those guys are fantastic. Um, having more native milkweed is a fantastic way to get um, some of this diversity going. And also it's fantastic when you guys go to these places, if they are selling something, it's been incredibly powerful for folks to just say, really? No, you shouldn't be selling that. Um, and people are amazingly responsive. But they're responsive when several folks ask. If just the weird professor dude asks, like, <laughs> oh, the professor dude, okay, it's okay, Mr. Green, all right, right. But when, when, when the general public asks, that has much more power, typically. <laughs> Um, and then uh, lastly, I'll just say uh, that um, there's a fantastic tradition, even if you guys not being activists, or just doing your do, just doing your stuff. And so this is um, the parkway out in front of my house on the left and my neighbor's house on the right. And so just doing the fantastic avocados you guys are doing, the fantastic grapes, uh, everything you're doing um, can be incredibly powerful in and of itself. Obviously it's fantastic for our wildlife, Right? It's much better for them, it's much better for you, and all that kind of good stuff. But it's amazing how, um, how that can have knock-on effects. And so in this case, I um, was doing, I was overhauling my uh, yard and doing stuff. And so obviously the parkway, we can't do just a massive bed of natives or whatever because there are, there are constraints there because of the right-of-way the city has, um, at least those of us in the city of Thousand Oaks. And so we can't just, can't just put whatever there. Um, so they want you to put lawn. In fact, a, a colleague of mine put in a, a split rail fence, a beautiful split rail fence with a lot of natives, had to rip it all out. Oh. Had to rip it all out because his neighbor complained. And the city oh. came and said, yeah, dude, it's parkway. You can't put just plants in the parkway, right? We have to be, if there's an emergency, whatever, we have to be able to you know, cross, cross over the, the parkway. Mm -hmm. So um, I put this demonia, this, 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 this uh, drought tolerant uh, ground cover that's not lawn, that does really, really well with not much watering at all. So I put that in, and then pretty, and then after a little bit, my neighbor walks over, he's like, what's this? I'm like, what, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, I just put this ground. Oh, it looks expensive. No, it's not that expensive. And then all of a sudden, boom, then he put his in. <laughs> and then down the street, boom, they put theirs in. And the next book, boom, they put theirs in. So, so you know, by doing the right thing, and you guys are all doing the right thing, by, by doing it in a good quality way, um, it doesn't seem like it maybe every single Saturday, every single you know, Tuesday at 5 p.m., but over time, it actually is very powerful. And it shows our neighbors and friends other ways of doing stuff, other ways of combating this scary stuff that is just good neighborly, right? Just good being good citizen, being good friends, and showing people a way, as opposed to yelling at each other, <laughs> as opposed to saying horrible things to one another and saying, you know, I don't trust you and you don't look like me and you don't vote the way I vote, so therefore you're evil. And it's, and it's a way of having conversation. It's a way of having conversation. And so that witnessing, that, that just being there and, and doing the right thing is, is um, I, I think we don't give enough, cre I'm, I'm not Pollyannish, don't think that that's gonna take care of 100% of the problems, but that can take us a long way, especially in our society now where we seem to be so pulled apart. And I think organic gardening is a fantastic way to bring people together. And so um, uh, I would just say that to wrap this up, that wonder is everywhere, even in the garden store. There's even, I really wanted to buy that Bigfoot, and my wife said no. Um, I know, it was a little bit expensive, only like 4,000. Oh my gosh. Uh, so, um, uh, but but it was really cool. So, that, but but um, whether it, whether that wonder is coming from stuff we do, uh, you know, in our garden with sculptures or whatever, or coming from just the 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 plants that we plant, um, we are in a fantastic place. And as you know, we can grow so many wonderful things here. And I want to thank you guys for all the work that you're doing to to be good stewards and to be showing others uh, ways to go forward. So. Um, so yeah, so I'll just say thanks for you guys, and any, I, I'm happy to answer any questions. I didn't go into super detail, but I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. So thanks, you guys. Uh, I have uh, uh, that tropical milkweed yep. that started from blowing in somewhere, mm -hmm. 
and it just comes up every year like yep. crazy. And I'm always chopping.